All right, now tonight, if you'll turn to the book of uh, Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew chapter number 10. And uh, verse number 22. You should be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say to you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Father, bless this book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. All right, you can be seated. You look at the context of Matthew chapter number 10. That's a pretty powerful statement here. He says, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Let me make this statement now right off the bat with all these things I'm covering tonight. This is not talking about individual sins in your life. The Bible tells you plainly in the book of 1 John chapter number 1. Look over here with me. 1 John chapter number 1. Verse number 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. It make a difference what person thinks that they're sanctified and that they don't sin or whatever. The Bible is very clear about this. That no man is sinless, okay? No man's sinless. In the book of Romans chapter 7, the apostle Paul says, With the flesh I serve the law of sin, the mind the law of Christ. O wretched man that I am. Speaking again to the same issue. So what's going on? These are individual cases that have to be dealt with individually as to who it applies to. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, but all scripture is not written directly to you. I'm a dispensationalist. One of the reasons I am is because I'm forced to be a dispensationalist by certain things that happen in the Bible. Can't go any other way. And when you read this, it says if you endure to the end, the same should be saved. Let me ask you a question now. Is this saying that if you live a sinless life? Look at it carefully now. In, you shall, uh, verse number 22. But he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Does this mean that he that lives without sin shall be saved? This is completely contrary to the word of God, right? So obviously it has to do with something that you can do that will affect your eternal life, right? Certainly it does. It's something you can do. And the Bible's pretty clear on that. Look at the book of, uh, notice verse 23. Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. See that in the context? All right. All scripture has an immediate application, yes, but it also has a future application, many of them. And this is prophetic. It's looking into the future. In other words, a lot of things happen, things happen in typology. They represent something greater that's going to happen later on. And this is what happens here. Now look over here with me to the book of Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse 4. I don't dodge, I do not believe in dodging any scripture. If your doctrine cannot stand according to the scripture, you need to change it. You need to get something right. And you need to understand why you believe what you believe. In Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse number 4, now look carefully at this. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and made partakers of the Holy Ghost, tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away. To renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. This has absolutely nothing to do with a Christian backsliding on God. Say, so why? Why would you use this on somebody who's not living right? It says it's impossible to renew them again into repentance. You see this text? Either it's right or it's not. Obviously, then it doesn't have anything to do with the personal sins in your life. It has to do with what you're doing with something. A greater idea. And that's what's going on here in Hebrews chapter number 6. Notice the book is addressed to Hebrews. Hebrews. It's addressed to Hebrews. Now look at chapter number 10 and verse number 26. Hebrews 10 verse 26. Hebrews 10 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. You see that? I don't want you to raise your hand, but how many ever sinned willfully after you received the knowledge of the truth? Uh-huh. You're guilty and I'm guilty. 
So what's going on here? Something far greater than simply what you do as a sinner. This has to do with something that relates to God directly. And so what is it? Well, notice the context. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. In plain words, you're turning away from the only sacrificial lamb there is. And you're, when you do that, there's no more sacrifice. Now, here's the problem. Where do you apply this? You see, the context of it, when do you apply it now? Or would you apply it in the future? Or did it have an immediate application that looked forward to the future? In the transition from Judaism into Christianity, there was a lot of Jews, the Bible says in John chapter number 6, who went back. They heard his testimony, and he told them plainly. They, they said to him, this is a hard saying. Who can hear this? And they turned around, and they walked away from him. And the, the Lord Jesus said to the disciples, will ye also go away? And that's when the famous statement was said, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. To whom shall we go? It's a matter of where you're going. It's a matter of what you're doing with the truth. It's a matter of how much of that truth abides in your soul. Today, if you are called upon to leave as you walk out this house, or you're in this house, or you're at home, or you're on your way home, and you leave, you begin to leave, you're leaving your body, what are you trusting? That's the key. That's the most important question you can ask yourself this day. All right, now listen to this. Higher awakening, first off, whatever is God, singular, or whatever is God, is not something that is separate from the higher awakening of the human body mind and who see any who see God as something that is separate from human beings does not see real God but a God of the mind a God of the book it is the higher awakening of a couple mechanisms in the brain located known as the pineal or pineal or pineal gland in the pituitary glands that this God state of being is awakened. Now you're beginning to get the key, the red flags. Watch what's fly, flying here. Real life has nothing to do with the blasphemous Bible or the Koran or any other work of ordinary salt of the earth, mankind. Well, let me explain it to you, folks. That is simply a westernization of Hinduism. They call it the New Age Movement. And it's simply, it's simply saying that you are God, and God abides within you because God is a concept, a spirit concept, that you realize you're God. And so by doing that, of course, you reject the Bible and you reject Christ, you reject Christianity. I read a thing on the way to church, right before I came to church tonight, it was talking about a lot of these singing groups, these modern singing groups, uh, Christian singing groups, are abandoning Christ and they're going into the New Age movement. See? All right. Now note carefully. Look what Peter says. First Peter, second Peter rather, chapter number two. Second Peter two, verse twenty two. Second Peter two, twenty two. Let's start with verse twenty one. Second Peter chapter number 2, verse 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. Have you ever heard a preacher preach that? You ever heard him use that text as his message? That's the truth. It had been better, which of course opens up an entirely different stream of thought tonight. I don't have time for that, but it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. You notice carefully, notice carefully. He's not saying anything about sins. Look what he's talking about. He's talking about the way of righteousness, Christ. It had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. See this? The Apostle Peter, as I said in Sunday school this past Sunday morning, mentions the new birth. The new birth. Peter does. Not just John. 
Peter mentions the new birth two times in 1 Peter, talking about that salvation. So what's happening here? What's happening here is very simple. They didn't commit sins or begin to commit sins and try to walk a straddle the fence and Christian on one hand and, and, and a worldling on the other. No, they just officially turned from the holy commandment and went back to the place they came from. This is why they're still dogs and they're still sows. That's the issue here. Nobody lost anything. Now, to understand the New Testament, you have to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ showed up about 27, 28 uh, uh, A.D., depending on his birth. Some give his birth at 4 B.C., some 5 B.C. You know, that's not all that important. But the bottom line is his ministry was about three and a half years long. So if he was, let's just say he was born at zero. So he lived 33 and a half years, 33 and a half A.D. All right, Christ died. I believe it was just a little before, but that's not important. It wasn't long after that that the Apostle Paul was called. And the Apostle Paul is the first one to begin to write scriptures. Some believe, and there's no reason not to believe, that 1 Thessalonians was one of the first books that he wrote. Every chapter in 1 Thessalonians, every chapter, every last one of them, has a direct reference to the coming of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4 is a classical statement. So, so this was written by the Apostle Paul, probably 35 A.D., somewhere along in there. It's, it's early. It's early, okay? Now, Paul lived up until about 60, let's say about 68 A.D., 68, the way you get into these dates, folks, they don't agree. Let's say, let's say 65 to 69 A.D. Because he makes no mention of the overthrow of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. He makes no mention of that. And you'd think that if he was, had been alive when that happened, Paul would certainly let us know, right? Now, he passes on. He goes on to be with the Lord. He said, I fought a good fight, kept the faith, finished my course. All right. This is important. As the New Testament is written, doctrine is revealed. As the New Testament is written, it progresses from where it's dealing only with the Jew, go only to the house of Israel, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and it turns toward Jew and Gentile that make up the mystery given to Paul, the body of Christ, okay? And so all up until 68, 69 A.D., the Apostle Paul is writing books like Ephesians, Romans, and they're very powerful books. Look over here with me. Over here for, in Ephesians, for example. Turn over here to chapter number 1 of Ephesians. Chapter number 1 in verse 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In whom also... In whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, now look at this, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. See the sealing? The sealing is two things. Number one, it's a mark of God's ownership upon you. Number two, it's a sealing that seals out the power of hell. Satan can no longer get your soul. Now, he can ruin your life, but he cannot get your soul. Now, who wrote this? Paul wrote it. Who did he write it to? He wrote it to the church at Ephesus. When did he write it? Probably 60 A.D. Long into the progression of the revelation from God. Now look at Romans. The book of Romans, chapter number 8. Romans 8. Let's see over here. Didn't have this one marked, but I'll find it. Romans chapter 8 and verse 38. All right, here we are. Let me get me a Bible where the pages don't stick together. Stuff them. 
marked, but this one. Now look at verse 38, Romans 8, 38. I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. See that? Now that's strong, okay? Now, I only use a couple of places where the Apostle Paul is writing, but Paul, without question, believed that once you're born again, once you're born of the Spirit of God, you're sealed. You belong to God. Nothing's going to separate you. Now, you've got four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels. That's just an arbitrary term. Nobody in the Bible does it call them that, but the synoptic simply means they have essentially the same view of the life of Christ, okay? They're interchangeable with a lot of things that happen. The Gospel of John is different, altogether different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the Gospel of John is the last book of the Gospels written in the New Testament. The last book that closes the canon is Revelation. Now, one man wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the Gospel of John and the Revelation. Who was that? One man wrote them. The Apostle John. Now remember, the Apostle John, not John the Baptist, but the Apostle John. Remember what the Lord said about John? He said, you're going to see me come. Did you know there's no record in the Bible of John ever dying? No record. Did you know by that it makes John a kind of a type of the church? Like Enoch was back in the book of Genesis? Of course, that's a different study altogether, too. But John's quite a thing. Now, which book in the Bible is the most powerful book in the Bible to support the doctrine of eternal security? The Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is strong on eternal security. Now, it's important to understand the chronology of the New Testament. The Gospel of John is the last gospel written Kingdom's already been offered. The king rejected. Kingdom rejected. Elijah could have been, John the Baptist could have been Elijah. The second opportunity in the book of Acts has already passed. We're way past all of that, and now we are entering into the church age. And uh, we have, uh, we have uh, what's following, of course, are the apostles, the apostolic fathers that follow. So the gospel of John, the last gospel written, note carefully, is the book about, the, about eternal security. Now look at it. John chapter number 3 at verse 16. Most of you know that one, don't you? You know where I learned that, book, that scripture? I learned it at Beaumont Grammar School. Public school. That's awful. Lord have mercy. What are they doing teaching the Bible in school? Well, that's awful. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave us he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Now let's start with the foundation. Go to John 5, 24. Notice where we are. We're staying in John. John 5, 24. <coughs> verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not perish come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life that's pretty clear isn't it Amen. look at John chapter number 10 verse 27 remember where we are now this is being written about 90 95 AD <coughs> John writes this he's probably got Matthew Mark and Luke in his lap laying next to him somewhere and John writes this. We don't know that it was on the Isle of Patmos when he wrote it, but we do know that John wrote it late in the early church. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And my Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. 
I and my Father are one. I just got a letter. I opened it today. Read it today. Right before I came to church. We get the mail. Miss Moreland gave me the mail this morning. And I read it this afternoon. I take that mail. I take it up into my closet. And I lay it down on the floor. I get down on my knees and I pray. And I put my hands on that. And I pray for these people. I pray for them. And uh, I think they know that. I think they know that. We're not here for their money. This is a ministry. But this woman wrote a letter. And this is one of the sad cases. She says that she's a Christian. Her daughter's a Christian. She says, but her daughter just passed away. She says, my daughter was a drug addict. She said, just a few days ago, we went to a revival meeting. My daughter was there two nights. She went to the revival for two nights. And she went down in the altar and got down on her knees and poured her soul out to God and wept all over that altar, talking to God from her soul. But she's a drug addict. She's a drug addict. They need special care. They need a mature Christian who's got half cents to know how to deal with somebody like that. You see what happened to her? She died. They found her in, in the home uh, next to the bed or somewhere. I forget exactly where it was. Young woman, young woman, broke the heart of her mother. But her mother is convinced that her daughter was a Christian. And that Christian died from a drug overdose. So be awful careful. Be awful careful when you deal with people. Drug addiction is a horrible thing. And, and using, if you're in here this house tonight and you've never been, never had anything to do with drugs and all that, you ought to thank God. Amen. That's one battle you didn't have to fight. Amen. There was a stigma attached to it when I grew up. They called them dope heads or dope fiend. How many ever heard that term, dope fiend? Sure, that's what they called them. And of course, by saying that, it was all moral. That's a moral judgment. Well, however they got started, and let me say this tonight. If you ever get started in drugs, you're stupid. You're stupid. And uh, sometimes they do it just to be accepted by the crowd they're running with, and sometimes to escape, and, and very, all kinds of different reasons people do things. But the bottom line is, once it's happened, it's happened, right? Once it's done, it's done. Now, can anything be done to help that? Is the blood of Christ, God's Son, able to cleanse from it? Is he able to give you spiritual power? Because your flesh will never do it. There's no flesh that can overcome the flesh. Flesh can't overcome the flesh. And you're addicted, you're a, drug, you're a drug addict, and you'll be that for the rest of your life. It doesn't mean you have to take drugs the rest of your life. It doesn't mean that you have a hopeless case. But what it does mean is that you've got to understand that there's a weakness in your body. And you cannot just overlook it. We don't all have the same battles to fight. We don't all have to fight the same demons. But if you are, and I believe that girl was saved, I would, I would say to her mother, take comfort, dear sister. Your daughter's with the Lord. She poured her heart out. She poured her soul out to God. But the drugs had a hold of her. What she apparently, sometimes I guess the best thing to do is to get people like that around where they can be monitored and, 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 and help until they dry out or whatever they call it. Uh, you know, to the point to where they can, they get through the, uh, through the initial withdrawal symptoms. And it has to be people who know what they're doing. they got to know what they're doing to help somebody that's a drug addict. But here's what, I, I want to see them helped, don't you? Now, he said right here, he said, no man can pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. That's eternal security. You're in the hand of God. I had a good old soul about 40 years ago she meant well she said yeah but you can pluck yourself out of the hand of God <laughs> that's making the Bible say what the Bible doesn't say you think you could pluck yourself out of the hand of God <laughs> like that old boy a country boy said one time talking about wrestling with God he said you kidding I couldn't wrestle with the Lord well the Lord do me in he was talking about Jacob back there at Peniel you know wrestling with the angel of the Lord some folks have just plain old good common sense that a Ph.D. in theology doesn't answer. Yeah, yeah, they do. And so John chapter number 6 and verse 35. Notice where we are now. Notice what gospel. Did you know of all the gospels in the Bible, John's the most hated? They don't like John. They don't like John. John doesn't fit. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. 
He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Never. Ever, ever. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Yeah, but you can cast yourself out. See what you get? For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Now watch this. This is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. I take my comfort in knowing the Lord Jesus is my Savior, and he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. He keeps it. I don't keep it. He keeps it. Okay? These passages that I gave to you tonight have to do, like Matthew 10, 22, and uh, verse 23, Hebrews 6, 4, and Hebrews 10, 26, and 2 Peter 2, 22. They have to do not turning from sins, but from turning from the Savior who saves from sin. Now, dispensationally, when you get into the tribulation period, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved, is what he's talking about here. In other words, the Antichrist is strong. It's a strong draw. And when they make a profession of faith in Christ at the beginning of the tribulation, but again, eventually yield and turn back to where they came from and reject him for various reasons, whatever, then my dear friend, they're not going to heaven. But that's the time of Jacob's trouble. You see in the Old Testament, David said, Lord, take not thine Holy Spirit from me. He said that because the Holy Spirit could have been taken from him. You remember Saul, first king of Israel? Spirit left him and another spirit came. David came in, played on the harp, and the spirit left him. But he came back again because Saul was a murderer. He had the priest of Nob put to death. I think it was 50 of them or something. I don't, it had been a while since I've read it. But he had a bunch of priests put to death. He was a, he was a vindictive, vengeful person. And the Bible says plainly that an evil spirit came upon Saul, King Saul. That's Old Testament, all right? Worry about losing it in the Old Testament. You cannot lose your relationship with God when you become a son of God by the new birth. Sons and daughters. You've got the same body you had before you were saved, but your spirit and your soul is his and entirely different. And if you don't know what I'm talking about tonight, about the struggle that goes on, then maybe there is no struggle. But when God saved me in 1973, I was in a dog fight and didn't know it. For, the about, for about two weeks, as I've told you before, I just floated everywhere. I don't know how I got there. I just floated. I mean, I'm telling you right now, I, I, I walked with the angels and floated, and the sun shone, and the birds sang, and, and the Bible just jumped out at me alive. And I thought, Lord, I haven't read this book in my whole life. And now all of a sudden, it's the most wonderful thing I've picked up in my life. And uh, the reason it is because the Holy Ghost is witnessing to the Bible. And the Spirit itself beareth witness. So, you know, this new birth that I've experienced, have I been sinless since God saved me? No. No, I haven't been sinless. But remember what John said. He said if we, have, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. That's exactly what he's talking about. So, to summarize everything that I've said tonight, not one place that I've read to you where they lose it has nothing to do with what they've sinned. It has to do with what they do with the Savior. And the context of it has to do with that early period when the Hebrews were transitioning over from, the, from, the, uh, from Judaism into Christ or in the tribulation period itself where they had to make a public confession. They believed on him and then they didn't believe on him they turned away from him. But folks, you can't take that scripture and preach it to somebody now. If you're going to do that, okay, if you're going to do that, let's go back to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse number 26. How many have sinned willfully since you were saved? Or how many of the devil drug you into it and the devil's to blame for all of it? You know, and you just couldn't resist the devil, and he just tied you up. And buddy, it was when it was over with you, the devil did it. 
How many of you accept responsibility for your own sins? Amen. Did you willfully sin? This is a crux. This is a big deal. Did you willfully sin? Of course you did. Not all sin. Sometimes you stumble into something, wind up where you didn't expect to be. You know, you find yourself in a vulnerable position or something. All things can happen to people. But I guarantee you, somewhere along the line, you said, well, I'll tell you what. Now, I willfully sinned. You did. All right, what are you going to do? It says there's no sacrifice for your sins. What can you do tonight? <coughs> I'm giving you logic, folks. I'm taking the Bible, and I'm reading it for you. Now you tell me, what are you going to do if you sin willfully? Are you saying, preacher, that everybody else in the Bible that gets forgiveness of sins, none of them sin willfully, just a few? No, that's not what it says. <coughs> what do you do? There's no more sacrifice. Have you noticed? The sacrifice is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no more Christ. See, there is no more Christ for your sins. There's no one else that you can go to. Now look at Hebrews uh, 6 and 4, and we'll close here. Six four Hebrews. It is impossible. Impossible is a heavy duty English word. You know that, don't you? That's a strong term. That's not a nuance. That's not a shaded meaning. That's cut and dried. Impossible. All right. Now look at this. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. Watch this. Seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. I'll just have to quote it because I can't find it in my hand. And put him to an open shame. Is that what it says? All right, now, let's use logic again. Why do you preach to people? If you're in a church that believes that you're going to lose your salvation, what are you preaching to them for? It says it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Has anybody ever preached that to you? Think about that for a moment. Why would he preach it to you? Just to mock you and make fun of you? Make you feel bad about yourself? If I got up here, if I, if I honestly believe tonight that everybody in this house is a sinner that sinned somewhere, and then I got up in front of you and said, it is impossible to renew you again to repentance. That's tough stuff. No hope. No hope. But if any man come unto me, I will in no wise cast him out. He said that. Christ was, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Thank God. I read a thing yesterday, a couple days ago, about this man who believes in, believes in limited atonement. He said, I'm going to tell you why I believe in limited atonement. He says, all that, that come under the atonement, that are covered by the atonement, that are covered by the blood, belong to the Lord to begin with. And so, therefore, he's going to keep them. And he uses all of these eternal security scriptures that I just used. See? Because you are one of the elect, the sovereign God. Be careful. when you hear, All you hear from some fellow is the sovereignty of God, sovereignty of God, sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. He answers to nobody. He's the Almighty. But that's not the way they use it. The way they use it is to make you think that if you're not one of the elect, there's no hope for you. For God was in Christ reconciling the elect unto himself. Not imputing their trespassing to them, committed to us the ministry of preaching to the elect. Did I butcher the scripture? Of course I did. God was in Christ reconciling uh, certain races to himself. No, no. God was in Christ reconciling the French to himself. Or whatever. No. <laughs> so they need it worse than us. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> we, we all do, brother. Believe me. <laughs> God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. All right. That's that one side, and it's that one side with the world. Now, what's that mean? It means he bought every one of us. So how do you know that, preacher? Because the Apostle Peter says they denied the Lord that bought them. Isn't that powerful? 
But this guy comes along and says, he only bought the elect. See, limited atonement. And that's, to me, that's pretty bad stuff. Because if I get up and preach to people, go somewhere and try to witness, I look out at you and I say, I don't care who you are and what you've done. You can get right with God and you can be saved. Because the blood of Christ was shed for all of us. Amen. Father, bless your word. I thank you for this little time we've spent together. I pray, Heavenly Father, your word will go forth for the purpose that you intended. It will not return void. It will accomplish that which you please. Bless your righteous name. Amen.